I'm not sure if there has been a more important time to reflect on the nature of the Trinity than on this particular Trinity Sunday. The doctrine of the Trinity has exercised the minds of theologians for centuries and puzzled the general Christian population, I suspect, for even longer. It is the core of our understanding of who God is and who God isn't. Unfortunately, most of the descriptions have reflected on what it is not about rather than what it actually is. Today, I want to have a shot on, reflection, on reflecting on what the Trinity might indeed be able to say to us today. So here we go. My last two sermons on Ascension and Pentecost have had the underlying principle that we have generally missed the point of these feasts. I assert that the same goes for Trinity Sunday. The doctrine of the Trinity is nothing less than a searing critique of who we are as the people of God and how far we have moved God from the centre of our lives and kept God back out on the periphery and thereby failed to faithfully follow Jesus and we're now living with the consequences of those actions. In the doctrine of the Trinity, we affirm that there are three persons, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. We also affirm that they have their own identity, if you like, their own essence. This means that the Father is the Father, but the Father is not the Son or the Spirit. Likewise, the Son is the Son and is not the Father or the Spirit. And again, for the Spirit, the Spirit is the Spirit, but is not the Father and not the Son. And yet, despite these three having their own essences, or their own essence, they are one. They are undivided. They are a unity. That's part of the mystery. Out of this unity, this oneness, our humanity was created. In the beginning, we read in Genesis, God created humankind in his own image and likeness. In his own image and likeness, he created them male and female. Even though we have our own individual identities as male or female, because of our origin, the Trinity, our humanity makes us one. That's where our ultimate unity is, our humanity. Athanasius, in his creed, reminds us that in the Trinity, none is a fore or behind. They are co-equal, the majesty co-eternal. The second person of the Trinity is equal to the Father as to touching his divinity and inferior as to touching his humanity. This reminds us that although we are created in the image and likeness of God, we are still the created beings and therefore inferior to the Creator. However, because the Creator is inherently co-eternal, co-equal, sorry, because uh, despite the individual members, then the Creator's creation must be co-equal also within its individual members, male and female. Our unity is not in our individuality as male or female, but in our common humanity being made in the image and likeness of God. This humanity has many expressions, as we know and understand, in the various nations and races. However, the underlying reality is our created humanity, which unites us and makes us one. We see this worked out in the biblical understanding of the human relationship in marriage. We read again, a man will leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So that even though the man and the woman have their own distinct essence, as in the Trinity, they, like the Trinity, are one. The only problem, of course, is ours is imperfect. The Trinity is perfect. We see that imperfection, don't we, in our imperfect relationships. When we move away from God or move God away from the centre of our lives, from, uh, from number one in our lives, our understanding of our createdness then becomes distorted. We fail to understand who we are in the created order. The high point that is true, but with that position comes responsibility. And instead of being stewards of the creation, we have become exploiters. And that exploitation of the creation has made its way into our exploitation even of our own humanity. So that instead of being one in our humanity, as our creator God intended, we have become fractured and fractious. And we are no longer one. However, this is not a new phenomenon. Slavery, war, subjugation of other races and nations has been going on since time immemorial. 
A few days ago was the anniversary of the Tiananmen Square massacre, when the Chinese government sent in its army to quell democracy activists. In the 60s, Russia sent in tanks into Prague to crush the, the Prague Spring. And recently Donald Trump threatened to send his army in if the governors did not send in the National Guard, and he used words such as overwhelming and dominance. The riots that have broken out in America are a sign of simmering discontent that has been there for much longer than our recent history, and I am old enough to remember the LA riots after the death of Rodney King. However, we in Australia are not immune. I remember the Cronulla riots of a few years ago, and we all have the stain of our mistreatment of First Nation people in this country. Aboriginal deaths in police custody happen here, and a, and a Royal Commission took place. Recently, a similar incident that occurred in America occurred in Australia, uh, happily without the death of the young person. But it's a tragedy that it took place in the first place. This fractious nature is not just in our world. It is also in our churches. When we bite and snap at each other, no matter how justified we might feel we are, we fall into this same shame of disunity. We mar the image of God, for we fail to be our true created selves, one. Jesus prayed in the upper room before he died on the cross that the disciples would be one as he and the Father were one. This does not just go for us as Christians, but us for as human beings as well, made, created in the image and likeness of God. We might think that we have good reason to have our tribes, our denominations, but I suspect that when we stand before the Lord on the day of judgment, all of our excuses will come to naught, and I suspect we will look pretty silly. We will also look pretty silly when we try to explain to God, when we stand before him, as we surely will, why we have caused so much pain and anguish in our churches, in our denominations, in our Christian world and towards the world at large. Claiming to having done what we have done for the betterment of our church, to get rid of those whom we felt were doing great damage uh, to our church community, to our diocese or to our denomination, will look pretty pathetic when our actions are compared to the life of Jesus and to the cross of Christ. I'm not saying that we should not defend our faith or stand up for our faith, but we had better do it with unity in mind, with the intention of bringing everyone together and not dividing, with the intention of not causing people to be pushed out, but to be drawn in. Even Jesus, as he was being nailed to the cross, pleaded with his Father to forgive them, for they did not know what they were doing. To be sure, people who eschew the gospel will, of course, cause consternation, dissension, and even division. And it is surely easier to remove them than to live with them. But it is not our job to push them away, but to encourage them to be reunited, to be reconciled with God. St Paul in the second epistle to the Corinthians in chapter 5 and verse 20 writes, Therefore we are ambassadors for Christ, certain that God is appealing through us. We plead on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Here, even when Paul expels the, even, uh, even when Paul expels the immoral brother, and hands him over to Satan in 1 Corinthians 5, which, by the way, I think is his way of saying uh, to the community, cast him back out into the world uh, where he came from, because that's the realm of Satan. It is not for his eternal destruction, but so that the body, his body, may be raised on the day of the Lord. There is an expectation, even in Paul, that such a person, despite all the sin, might have the opportunity to be reconciled with God. This must be therefore our purpose as well, to be reconcilers, drawing people back, not pushing away, uniting, not dividing. For this is the nature of God, the one true God, the triune God who made us in his image and likeness, male and female, he made us in the image of God. 
In Luke 4, chapter, verse, in Luke 4 uh, verses 16 to 21, after his temptation, Jesus comes into Nazareth to the synagogue and declares his just cause. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set the free the oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. This is all about bringing people back to God. This is about restoring their true humanity. This humanity is distorted through sin, yes, which is our abandoning of God, yes, our pushing him away from the centre of our lives, yes, Instead, therefore, of living the lives we're meant to lead because of our being made in the image and likeness of God, what we end up leading are lives that are fractious, self-centred, small, exploitative, the consequence of pushing God away from the centre of our lives. The just cause of Jesus in Luke, in one sense, does not seem to have been achieved, but it was and still is. For it is not a finite cause. It is infinite. It goes on and on and on. Jesus did indeed proclaim all those things. He wasn't there to actually go and release captives out of, out of Herod's jail, but to proclaim release. And yet he set people free from the prison of their bodies that were not behaving as they were created to behave. He proclaimed sight to the blind and also gave physical sight to demonstrate what he was on about. Yet all those points in his just cause were not finite, in that they did not end when his mission and ministry ended. It was continued in the life of the disciples. It's, if you like, an infinite game. Players come and go. The disciples came and went, and others took their places. And now we are in the game. We are those inheritors of the disciples. The rules have changed a little bit, but the goal remains the same, to stay in the game, to bring about the kingdom of God here on earth as it is in heaven. Our role is to continue to preach good news to those who need to hear it. Those who are impoverished, proclaim freedom to those who are not free and recovery of sight to the blind. We are called to free the oppressed and to declare the year of the Lord's favour. This must be our just cause because it is the just cause of Jesus and Jesus was sent from the Father and he and the Father are one. The church has long declared, if you want to know what God is like, look at Jesus. Athanasius, in his explanation of the Trinity, started with Jesus, and so must we. When we examine the life, mission and ministry of Jesus and seek to emulate him in our lives, then we will start to live the triune life of God. We will still need to have a basic working knowledge of the complexities of the Trinity, but at the end of the day, the Trinity is a relationship at three levels. The internal relationship between the three persons, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Then the triune relationship with the creation, that's us, through Jesus as the earthly manifestation of the second person of the Trinity. And thirdly, our own interpersonal relationships as the image bearers of our God and Heavenly Father. Just as the oneness of the triune relationship was self-evident in the person of Jesus, so our relationship with the Trinity will also be self-evident in our human relationships. But at the moment, as I look around the world in which we live, and in the church of which I'm a part of, I have to say that we are doing an appalling job of being ambassadors for God and living out our life in the manner in which it was designed by the triune God whom we claim to serve. Now, I suspect, I am starting to realise why we really don't like reflecting on the Trinity at this time. It shows us all who we really are and not what we claim to be. Our divisions and our dissensions demonstrate how far from God we really are and how even more desperately we need to, be, we need to truly repent, to turn back and follow Jesus and make him the centre of our lives once more. When we do that, then we will truly bring about the kingdom of God here on earth as it is in heaven. The Lord be with you.